Welcome back to Scrub League, everybody. It has been a while. I am Kevin Hamilton. As always, we have our bronze goddess here, Samantha Heeman. Say hello. Hey, guys. And we have a new face on the team to replace Colin McNeil, who went and got himself a real job. We've got Aiden McCarville joining the show. Why don't you say hello, Aiden? Hey, guys. How is it going? So, Aiden is someone that Sam and I have played HOTS with for a very long time. And we thought his particular set of skills and sarcasm could serve us very well on our new project. Sam, why don't you tell us what the new direction we're going in now with Scrub League is? Well, we've decided that instead of trying to cover all of the esports, uh, we've decided to focus purely on Heroes of the Storm. And this is mostly because uh, we know that all three of us play it, we enjoy the game, we know a lot about the game at varying skill levels. Um, and we just really enjoy this particular game as an eSport as well. Um, so we feel like we can give more informed answers to different questions, uh, more informed kind of stories and things to keep you guys up to date on what's going on with the game and in the pro scene. So we've kind of just decided to streamline our show with our favorite uh, eSport in order to bring you guys better content. Yeah, that and we have access now to Aiden, who is just... We, once we lost our sound engineer, we, we needed some backup. So we've got Aiden on the show now. He is our uh, recording and editing slave. So we appreciate that very much. Oh god, I'm being hyped up so much. This is this is not going to end well. Yeah, you really need to deliver. So uh, we'll we'll trot you out. You can do your clown act, and then we'll we'll put you back in the closet to do your video editing. Aiden will also be uh, participating with me on a new series that we're bringing out, uh, which is essentially going to be my journey or attempted journey out of bronze. Now, uh, both Kevin and Aiden are above bronze in ranked play. And so what we'll be doing is um, subjecting them to coaching my playing of different characters. And through that, you guys will be able to see uh, some strategies and kind of builds and different gameplay aspects that you can use in your own game if you're trying to rank or if you're new to the game. Yeah, so I mean, that's up on our new YouTube channel right now. Um, normally, you can find us uh, on SoundCloud and, and elsewhere, but right now we're uh, we're venturing out into YouTube. Um, so we've got that. Aiden, I have to say, you were very gentle with Sam on uh, the first go. When I mean, it was the first time, you know, I can't I can't just go whole hog right away. I'm I've... assuming there was a whole lot of swearing going on off of mic, so I appreciate that the vitriol was kept uh, silent. Oh, I was using push to talk for a very good reason. You guys can check out that uh, little coaching session if you want to be both amused and learn something. Um, and that'll be up as well at the same time as this episode. So feel free to check that out. Leave us a comment if there's a particular hero that you would like to see us play and that you would like to learn about. Yeah, or a particular tactic that you think or like aspect of the game that we need to improve on. Like, for instance... Soaking and getting XP, I swear to God. Why would we ever need instruction on that? We do that all the time, forever, and you never have to tell us. Yeah, you I mean, focus on that all the time, Kevin. Yeah, you, you, it's true, you absorb XP passively. I don't have to tell you to do that, but there's a bit more to it than that. You're welcome. Yeah, so Aiden, why don't you tell, uh, why don't you tell the folks at home exactly how Sam did on your favorite character? Well, she got... Well, we got one, maybe two... I think there was one actual kill that I could call a dunk, which is m honestly more than I was expecting for that particular session. Thanks, and then buddy. I think there was one dunk in heavy air quotes that was, you know, like a foot away. But we'll call it a dunk, because it, it was your first real time playing Asphodan. So I'll give you that one. Despite having played since the beta, somehow. I Asmodan was just never on my radar. Honestly, I was kind of intimidated by him. Um, I do like to move around a lot, and I feel like with him you kind of have to think before you move and be very... Um, I guess the word is, like, not logical, but more... You, you have to plan your movements a little bit more. Uh, he's not as fast, he's got a huge hitbox... 
And um, so using stuff like black pool, well, you know, I want to be moving around and I kind of have to stay in one spot, use that and then move. So it took a lot more forethought, I guess, than I was used to. Um, right, by cool. the end of it, I actually found it a lot of fun once I kind of learned how to properly use him. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. I find he also requires a, a, quite a bit of map awareness. Um, not to <laughs> not to throw you under the bus here, Sam, but it's not always your strong suit. I find you can get tunnel vision quite a bit, which when you're playing Asmodan can get you killed. Uh, yeah, see, that's his semi-nice way of saying, I have a bit of bloodlust. And when I zero in on a hero I really, really want to kill, it kind of comes hell or high water. I'm going to try and get that hero. And uh, it, it definitely caused me to take a step back and be like, okay, I can't run into the fight. I have to stay back and do different things. So. Well, well fact of the matter is we're going to get you up to being a Medivh main in Platinum just as soon as we can. Yep. Uh, so that's one of our new features that we're coming out with. Another one is we're trying to do some uh, gimmicky novelty comps to entertain you folks. Um, our first stab did not go so well. Uh, we no. attempted a, a full turret build of Sergeant Hammer and Probius and Gazlo, which was my idea. And Aiden, you can tell them exactly how that went. Um, it was a terrible idea, and we canceled Kevin's idea privileges from now on. Yeah, Probius should just not be involved in things. Hey, hey, you don't talk smack about Probius, okay? It's not his well, fault. It's actually, our, our interview is coming up a little bit later. We're going to talk smack about Probius for me, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, so, uh, before we get to the interviews we've got lined up, we have members of Roll20 and Team Freedom uh, that we spoke to a little bit earlier in the week. Um... Big news, obviously, is HGC opening week just passed us by. Uh, this recording will release after opening week, but before the uh, the direct elimination begins. Um, what do you guys think about uh, the the first uh, pool play? I think I think it was actually really good, and I, I I found myself more excited about it than last year. Uh, I feel like it was better advertised, um, and. There's some surprise teams there, and I, I will come out and reveal my my pick for uh, the HGC Finals. I'm going to go with the Scrappy Underdogs, Roll20. Uh, I think they are kind of being hyped up as the new hope for North America. And I, I just kind of, I like their personality as they play. I like their kind of aggressive team fight style. Um, and they're the kind of been the ones I've been watching this whole time, and I'm just kind of like, you know, sitting there kind of hoping and cheering for them. So they are an underdog. They've got some very tough competition coming up because we've got MVP Black, which is so far undefeated um, uh, Korean team. And, you know, the big powerhouses from Europe, like Team Dignitas and um, Fnatic, which are going to be super hard and hard to beat. And we've also got other Korean and, and Chinese teams as well. I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of taking the scrappy underdog route on this one. That's kind yeah, that of is. that's kind of the way I've been going as well. I mean, it's funny as despite being um, a person who you know streams semi regularly and is involved in this fine venture we're going on, I haven't really been someone who like follows streamers or watches esports anything like that. Despite always wanting to get involved in this sort of thing, so it's always very weird watching uh championships and things like that because specifically because you always see all these picks where i go hmm i'm not used to that this is very odd for me to watch or bands where it's very obviously a targeted ban against a specific team but it's not something i'm used to seeing so it just kind of it throws me right out of things those oh, are the fans though yes Oh man, all the the Abathur Leoric team comps out of Dignitas and Team Freedom just I didn't know what to expect. I still don't fully understand it. I mean, I think it's because Leoric is, you know, he's got good mobility, so he can wear a hat pretty well and chase people, and he's good at stalling out team fights, so 
Abathur's push can get a little bit more value. But I, I mean, that's that's some clearly next level thinking that I just have not seen before. Yeah, and a whole lot of double support comps coming out. Um, there was a lot of that, uh, and naturally there was a lot of Murden. He just got the rework, um, so a lot of tank picks going to Murden, which I didn't yeah. find surprising at all. Murden seems pretty busted right now. I expect him to. Yeah, he he seems to offer a lot to uh, to a team comp, possibly possibly too much, if I'm honest. Just stuns upon stuns, and he can sustain ability. He's got a bit of wave clear. At this point, you might as well just grab Haymaker for the extra CC on top of that. I was also seeing a lot of Rhaegar picks. Like, a lot of Rhaegar picks. Rhaegar's just great. He's, like, a very solid pick. Um, he's good in pretty much any situation. He can be aggressive, so you still keep your damage up when you're doing double support. Um, yeah, I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. It's I because guess in my we're... lonely little bronze league, we don't see a lot of Rhaegar. Exactly. It's it's what, like I was saying, it's what we're used to seeing. Uh, you pick this, the healers that don't need a lot of coordination. You know, you would see a Malfurion a lot in the regular games we're playing. People even take Lucio all the time in the games we play just because you don't need to coordinate with your team to be putting out constant healing effect with those guys. You can just sit in the back lines and do your thing. Whereas, you know, when you have a team of five professionals, they can get together and do some cool things. And while I did see some awesome Lily play, I did not see Lily picked as much as I wanted her to be. Well, the fact that we even saw Lily is pretty great. Actually, the diversity of heroes that we've seen in HGC is, is I think, one of the big stories. Um, I saw someone say, I think it's that we've seen... 52 of the available 75 heroes have been uh, picked or shown up at any one point. Like, we've seen Sergeant Hammer. We've seen, uh, obviously, we've got, you know, Abathur. We saw uh, Butcher show up. We've seen a lot of really interesting um, off-meta picks, and I couldn't be more enthused about it. That is great. It is great to see. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember off the top of my head what team it was, but there was a team that... Basil has been practicing Medivh as a secret weapon, which is awesome. Yeah, Medivh, he went away for a while, but I'm glad to see him back. I am not happy to see him back. I find him super annoying. Um, and I just, I, maybe it's another one of those heroes where I'm just like super intimidated by him and not sure how to fully utilize him. But I, I just don't, at least in casual play when we're playing, I don't really see... A use for him but the pros have really shown me that there is a major use for him you just got to be really specialized with him you just need to be very coordinated so uh aiden what would you say is your going to be your pick going into uh the actual finals this coming weekend after after doing my research and looking through some teams i'm going with my friends as i'm going to call them from now on in uh, tempo storm not the least because as we were talking about before, it's a funny name for for a team in that Storm is not a tempo deck, but I find that to be a funny joke. In Magic the Gathering. In Magic the Gathering. It is normally just a deck where you play Solitaire for 10 minutes and then win the game, which is hilarious to me. I love it. What What's hilarious to me is that you're picking Tempo Storm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was disappointing to see them almost get eliminated by a team with kittens in the name, but you know, I <laughs> I find the name Caterpillar hilarious, and I like that they have two strong flex picks. So it's not. I see a lot of teams that are you know kind of set in their roles. I like that they have a little bit more of a a versatile team. So maybe when they get over, let's assume it's Stage Fright, I have no idea. But maybe if they get over that, they can do some wild things with the meta. If they can get over being straight terrible. <laughs> Look. <laughs> Kevin is not mincing words on this team. Kevin. Well, as the only person who, who picked a reasonable team as, as their uh, go-to. It's um, easy to call it reasonable when you pick the undefeated team. Look, but I'm, I'm not picking a team that's the favorite to win the tournament. The favorite to win the tournament is Fnatic. Uh, I, my pick is MVP Black um, for a couple reasons. 
One is that they are actually good and a legitimate choice. The second, because they're um, like a lot of the the East Asian teams, they're like very aggressive. They're very entertaining to play, um, and they've got Rich on the team now. Which, I mean, he's just widely considered to be one of, if not the best players out there. Um, and he sealed my heart when he picked um, when he picked Butcher. He last picked Butcher in that one match, which is just an absurd troll pick um, against the the kittens. Uh, but he made it work. I mean, I think he got his meat quest done by level 14, um, even though his opponents were really trying to, to deny that. And I think it was hilarious because what MVP Black does, and it's so entertaining to watch, is that they'll like overextend to the point where the other team wants to punish, so they'll pursue and they'll dedicate a lot of resources to punishing while MVP Black gets ahead elsewhere on the map. Like on the objective or pushing a different lane. Uh, and it's just, it's genius to watch from a distance. So I would say MVP Black. I Once your teams lose in the first round, um, I encourage you to switch your allegiances over to MVP Black. Hey, Logical look, choice, Kevin. But again, I gotta go with my scrappy underdogs. I don't know. I feel like they are a bit disorganized. They... And this is roll 20. I, I just, I don't know. I kind of love them. I love their personality. Um, I think they're really entertaining to watch. Their tank is aggressive, but good. Um, they do have some flex players as well. Um, but his prismaticism is great to watch. Uh, he's a great assassin player. Um, and our buddy Goku, who we will hear from uh, later in this cast, um, I just, I don't know, when I, I, I was watching a few videos and one of the casters referred to Roll20 as like this new hope for TMA, Team NA and like, the, you know, their route to the top three or whatever. And I honestly think like they have the kind of, because the hard thing about esports is to get really connected to a team. It's, it's a lot harder to do that than in tr more traditional sports because you're watching someone play a game. You're not watching someone physically kicking a ball or doing or you know dribbling a ball you're you're watching them play a game so it's harder to get connected to a team and i feel connected to this team if that makes sense i would yeah, just I like mean, to i'd like to point out psalm on uh on tempo storm managed to complete his kelthazod quest in like four minutes that that shows potential for crazy 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 play yeah, that's ridiculous. That's like, like hitting all your skill shots on cooldown every time. I think that like it's generally pretty positive if you can finish it by eight minutes. So fitting it, finishing yeah. before the five minute mark is absurd. Yeah, I remember finishing it at one point by I think yes yeah, between six and eight minutes and just losing my mind because I thought I was just a god now. And then this dude who Kevin will not stop smack talking finishes it in four minutes and shows me that I still have a long way to go. Yeah, we all do. Um, so, I mean, as interesting as, you know, all the off-meta heroes were and some of the crazy plays, um, the actual victors from each of the pools was not really surprising. Um, and thankfully for us, um, our interviews from earlier this week with uh, America's Zug Rug Kangas of Team Freedom and Francisco Goku Avalos of Roll20. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be present for this interview, but I did have a few questions that I sent in to be asked of our pro players here, and now you get to experience my hot takes hearing their responses. Yeah, so one of the first questions we asked was, based on this series of interviews with all the team captains, uh, where they commented on, on the other teams in the tournament, one of them, a bunch of the team captains were saying that both Roll20 and Team Freedom relied very heavily on comfort picks, and that if they were, you know, taken from under them or banned out, that they might be struggling. And uh, this is what they had to say in response. Uh, I think earlier in the season we relied a lot on comfort picks, but since Western Clash and like deeper into the season, we really extended the way we draft and the heroes that we play. So I don't really think target banning our comfort picks is going to be a good strategy at this tournament. Prior to me joining the team, I felt like that's 
kind of what the Rule 20 did. Well, teammate was the name before, but Rule 20 relied on before I've been season brawl. But with uh, me being an addition to the team, I think that's certainly changed, and I'm pretty sure people are going to be in for a surprise. We definitely were surprised, I think, across this whole tournament by some of the crazy picks that came out. Definitely was not all standard stuff. I mean, obviously, we saw a lot of Murden, we saw a lot of Sonya, we saw a lot of Rhaegar. Um, but I don't think, you know, any of the teams are really relying that heavily on comfort picks. And I, frankly, and this is why I like Roll20, and Goku is part of that, because I like that little bit of sass he gives, that little bit of showmanship to say, yeah, you guys thought we'd be relying on comfort picks, but you're going to be surprised. It gives the audience something to hope for and something to kind of wait on the edge of their seat for. Like, what are they going to do that's going to surprise us? What are they going to do that's going to change things up? You could almost say these guys are the modern-day gladiators. You know what? That reference goes directly over my head. I don't know if you want to explain it. Just like gladiators in the, the Roman Colosseum. They would try to like, hype up the crowd. Oh, I see what you're saying. I assume that this was some sort of reference to, like... Like, the movie yeah. Gladiator? The movie Gladiator, yes. No, it's not all about Russell Crowe, as much as I love Russell Crowe. Yeah, he's pretty fabulous. Disagree. But yeah, your your point, Sam, about uh, the, the moxie of the North American teams is definitely warranted, because, you know, watching... The, the NA teams play on uh, Warhead Junction, where they just like cheese the map every time with an early boss push and a sustained comp, is hilarious. Um, and I really appreciate that, that they bring that style to the HGC. And I think it's something that's needed, and I think we'll talk about this later, is you need the audience to be able to connect with the players and not just the game. Because like in other sports, you need people to be invested in, in players to be able to keep them watching. Speaking of strange picks, uh, Aiden, you had us ask a question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to know uh, which hero these guys really wished could be more viable, and why is it Probius? Oh, gosh. Uh, that, no, I don't want Probius to be viable. That character would be so annoying, actually. But um, for a hero, a hero to be more viable, I think Kerrigan. Kerrigan's playstyle is such an aggressive playstyle and it's very unique. But she gets outclassed by certain heroes, like for example, Alarak kind of outclasses her. Like Alarak's a way safer Kerrigan and pr provides a silence for the team and it's an AOE. While Kerrigan combo is very predictable, very very avoidable, and you can see it coming. Um, my favorite hero is Murky, so I'd like to see Murky being more viable. I think he needs to be a bit stronger in team fights, maybe a bit more HP, so that he doesn't just get one shot when he shows up to a fight. Okay, I have to say I am honestly offended <laughs> that nobody seems to want Probius to be more viable in any kind of play, because I personally want him to be the hero I know he can be. I mean, he was the probe that warped in that critical pylon in the trailer, where the, the Protoss are retaking Iris. So he's kind of a big deal, and he should be a big deal. Although I thought that you'd be more appreciative based on the fact that they really like Kerrigan and Murky, who, if I'm not mistaken, Aiden, are two of your favorites. I mean, yeah, I have to admit, I enjoy the love for, especially Murky. I, I just, I want him to be present in all things. Um, but... On the same, at the same token, I kind of like having him as like my secret back pocket parlor trick I can just pull out. I almost don't want him to get buffed to the point where he used to be, where you just kind of saw him all the time. Yeah, he used to be after the buff to what is it, Big Tuna Kahuna, where he gains a ton of health. So as much as the pros don't want it. What do you think Probius, what would ha what would have to happen to Probius for him to be viable, Aiden, other than just being his awesome self? I mean, the way Probius is set up now is kind of an interesting base, where you have this, like, frankly, worthless main hero, and then a cool turret that he can make. So I would like to see the photon turret become, like, a big dangerous photon turret, like in, like it actually is in StarCraft. 
but you know amplified more so in that you can't because you can't have more than one uh, no matter how lucky you get so I would like to see it you know he can remain how he is his damage is pretty good on his uh, his W and Q combo that's fine but I want to see his turret become almost the second half of the hero that he needs so you can't just wander into a photon turret range and be okay somewhere between getting hit by a couple Gaslow turrets and getting shot by Sergeant Hammer should be like the threat level that I'm looking at. Yeah, I mean either that or like at least maybe one more turret. And I've always thought that actually like like in the base StarCraft game, you know, having it uh, reveal as part of his base kit might also be valuable. So you could be a pick kind of like Tassadar to counter some stealth teams. Yeah, I think I remember speaking about this with you guys before where basically I would love to see his uh, his photon turret quest just basically become baseline. Um, he kind of needs it because even with the buff to the photon turret damage, it's still not very impactful to the game. But being able to like see over walls and reveal is very very useful. It's just it's it's a usefulness added to a still not great hero, unfortunately. Yeah. So the next question that we asked uh, was about um, not so much the heroes as it was about the teams because Goku, for you know, as an example, he switched teams I believe ten times in the last two years, and a lot of players do switch teams quite often. So we asked them what their experience was uh, and how that affected their play. A lot of the um, I guess roster swaps that I've gone through, it kind of just added onto my experience. I want to basically know as much people I can where for me I felt was swapping through rosters and of course if I feel like a roster is stronger I would decide to go with that roster. Uh, so for me swapping, I don't know, for me, like personally I feel very flexible and I come into the team just trying to help them as much as I can. I'm not going to exceed my boundaries. I want to figure out how the team operates first, but I'm more as an addition and try to help them first before I give my input. Yeah, I know you said, Kevin, that he switched 10 times in two years, but I honestly think it's helped him develop uh, kind of his thing as a player. He's so flexible. He's able to adapt, um, able to adapt to different play styles, team situations, I really think it's made him a better player and it's part of the reason, again, that I picked Roll20 is that they do have that kind of flex player who's been in a bunch of different situations with different teams and can adapt his play accordingly. Yeah, I mean, like the character that is his namesake, he's grown through adversity. Not having watched a ton of anime, I uh, that's, a, that's a reference that goes over my head, but... I have to give props to someone who can swap teams this many times and still put in the effort and let's say put out a better performance than some teams other people on this podcast might have picked. Basically, Aiden, just for your education, uh, in Dragon Ball, the, the Saiyan race, once they're beaten within an inch of their life, they become stronger. So that's basically just the narrative of North America at this point, is they get savaged at every global tournament, and then they seemingly come back stronger. And speaking of North America, uh, we had a question for Zugrug of Team Freedom. Uh, now, you may be, not be familiar with Team Freedom's logo, but it is you know, the American flag on a shield. The team's name is Team Freedom. It's about as American a name as you could possibly get. But Zugrug, as well as um, two of the other members, so three of the five members of the team are actually Canadian. Uh, so we asked him what that experience is like. Yeah, we joke around about that a lot, actually. We just, I don't think anyone minds representing Team Freedom or having an American flag as their jersey. Like, But we just, we have fun with it, just being the Canadian team, but being like, which would be the most American team as our symbol and our name. When the casters ask us or something like, what's it like being on Team Team Freedom? And we'll just be like, well, 
it's nice, but you guys know we're Canadian, right? And then people call us weird. We should get like a maple leaf as a, on one of the sleeves or something. Uh, personally, I love that response. I think them kind of having fun with the fact that most of them are Canadian. Again, it just gives them a little bit of personality. But it does bring into question uh, the Canadian presence in this sport if most people don't know that there are Canadians on, on these teams. And the fact that, you know, when we say Team NA, it's not just the States, it's Canada too. Yeah, I mean, I, the thing about that is that, like, I think because Heroes is so global, it's kind of almost thought of as being, like, regional competitions almost, like NA versus Europe versus China versus Korea um, and, and other parts of the world. So I feel like almost... Canada and the United States become one in their, you know, in the condescension against NA. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, and on the other hand, it's it's kind of like making things a more official sport now. We're it's just like the NHL now. It, all the Canadians play on the the American teams, and we pretend that. The Americans pull their weight as well as the Canadians do. <sighs> yeah, and I think it has something, it comes down to identity too. I mean, the States is known for having baseball be their sport. We have hockey, and I think esports, In if I had to pick a country in general, and let's even to go specific with HOTS, it has to kind of go to Korea as the kind of heroes of the storm powerhouse, the one to beat. I can I can see the argument for that though specifically some of the NA plays on uh Warhead Junction kind of show at least to me an adaptability of the NA teams that I'm just not seeing in the the less so in in the the EU but the other teams are maybe not as adaptable to what some people might consider cheese well, one character that they won't have to think about or adapt to uh, will be Junkrat. And they disabled Junkrat for tournament play, and we really wanted to know what a couple of the pros thought about that and whether or not they would want him or let him be left kept out of this tournament. I'm glad Junkrat is in, the, in, the, in this patch. Uh, at the first start, he had a, like, before they decided to ban him, we, people were screaming with him and he had a very poor win rate. But, uh, of course, that's usually what happens with every new hero, unless they're extremely broken, just like Garrosh. But, uh, but with Junkrat, there's a sense of just annoyance that he brings, similar to, like, like late game murky, I would say, level 20 murky, where he just is unkillable. If, if there's a really good person that can play Junkrat, he probably could carry the team on his own. I'm I'm pretty happy that we don't have to deal with Junkrat. Just his poke is annoying, like a chromie, or like basically like a chromie, and just the displacements and everything. I think if people got good at the hero, it would have been maybe hard to deal with. I can I can see where they're coming from on this one. Uh, they there definitely was not a lot of time for people to adapt to Junkrat. And I don't know what I definitely never achieved the uh, the the pro level of junk rap play where I could carry a team with him. I can see just the he could definitely bring a lot of displacement and just annoying things that we already hate about, for instance, Garrosh. Uh, that would not be great to play against for <laughs> for other people on a professional level. Yeah, I mean, he's got such a strange kit because he's got, like, long-range poke, kind of like a chromie. He's got that annoying alt where he disappears and respawns, kind of like a murky. Ugh. He's got the displacement of, like, Garrosh. Like, I'm not saying he's as good as any of those heroes or would necessarily be a problem, but it's, like, a lot to take in at once. I am happy that he's not seeing professional play until what I'm assuming is the inevitable tweaking of that ult that you mentioned. Well, I mean, they already nerfed it a little bit, and then they buffed Riptire, but we'll see, you know, how the actual, like, win rates shake out. Well, I also asked them about, speaking of this, the pace of new hero and new map releases coming out in the game, and how that affects pro play. 
because they do have to change their their own play styles. They do have to change the way that they play every single time a new hero comes out. And uh, some of their actu answers actually surprised me. I think the pace of hero and map release has been good. Like we're getting new heroes like so often, and. I mean, we got the new map Volskaya, and it seems good, but if they release, like, new maps, like, so often, they probably wouldn't be, like, very balanced or anything. So I think, like, the pace of the map releases is good, and same with hero releases. Because if, if, if there weren't new heroes coming out all the time, like, in one meta, one team would just be the best, and if no heroes are coming out, then that team would just they being the best, but when new heroes come out, it shakes things up and you get like new teams rising to the top, which I think is better overall for the game. I actually really like what they said about uh, the constant map and hero changes helping it, the pro play to be more variable. So if you bring out a certain meta and then one team gets really good at that meta they stay on top all the time if you don't change up the meta so then you, that way you have different teams becoming stronger or weaker and it makes for more interesting tournaments where before this i kind of had the opposite response i was like okay they're bringing out heroes too fast they're bringing out maps too fast it's bringing out a lack of consistency that i don't think people have confidence in but having it explained to me like that from a player's point of view i can actually see now why new heroes coming out so often might actually be better for tournament play yeah i think that that the opinion's gonna vary you know wildly between different players you know some people i think like you know that Obviously, traditional sports like your baseballs and your footballs and whatnot, like they haven't changed dramatically in terms of uh, like the actual mechanics of play in quite a long time. Um, and it's just sort of the players and like their personal narratives and their skill levels and like teams that leads the day and gets people interested. Um, but I think that the fact that the mechanics of heroes are changing at such a reasonable pace. Um, I think is one of the big strengths, and, and certainly why I keep watching. Yeah, and I think, again, it comes down to it's harder to watch and be invested in a player who's playing um, a game and not someone you can see you know, hitting a home run. You're seeing a character do an action. So they have to find a different way to keep the audience interested. And if you're seeing the same strategies and the same moves over and over again, the audience is going to lose interest. And I think at this point, critical point in the HGC's kind of career, uh, they really need to keep people interested and keep people watching, and that's how you do it. To be honest, I think things like meta stagnation, in, especially in a game like this, they kind of tend to solve themselves, but introducing new heroes and new maps certainly helps to speed the process up. Otherwise, it does. I think it does tend to be a cyclical thing where something will become popular and powerful so people will start teching against that and then that thing that counters that will become the next popular and powerful thing and so on and so forth but introducing a new hero or a new map at a pretty regular rate does kind of shake up the process a lot more and it lets you get these fun moments where you have people experimenting with putting in something varied and new into their typical playstyle. yeah no i know what you mean like right now we're seeing like a you know, double sport comps that are getting used and you can kind of try and counter that with like a burst comp and then burst comp you can try and counter with like a heavy front line, you know, so on and so forth. Like it, it eventually does solve its, can go in a cyclical uh, pattern. I think I, I agree with you. Um, and then we, we gave uh, Zugrug and Goku one last question, which I think Aiden will interest you personally about what they thought was, would be the most Canadian hero. Probius. Probius. <laughs> Probius, like, when you think about it, he's like, he's quiet, he's cute, he's, he's, nobody really knows about him. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to just go ahead and immediately disagree. I think there is an objectively correct answer to this question, and that answer is Uther. He in the is... lumberjack, in the lumberjack skin? He has a lumberjack skin, so right there, he's... 50% more Canadian, but he is so dedicated to being helpful that he sticks around after death to keep helping people. Come on. 
Yeah, no, I'm I'm 100% behind you on that one, Aiden. That was actually the answer that I was expecting. See, I'm thinking Lily because she's so nice. You know, like she'll eat you, but then she'll be like, oh, this is so much fun. Or, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. She has this nice, chipper kind of Canadian attitude. I think I think it's Lily. I don't but know. then she drops a dragon on your head. Yeah, but then Uther can hit you in the face with his hammer. So what do you mean? I'm still going with Uther on this one. Mostly because, aside from the other stuff I said, he has two abilities dedicated to helping his friends. That's that's Canadian. Also, again, Lily has no lumberjack skin. Hear that, Blizzard? We need a Lily lumberjack skin, and quickly. Now, there were a few changes to the way the HGC is going to operate going forward in 2018 that we did want to get to covering, but we are pushing the boundaries of how long we want to spend talking into microphones. As excited as we are to talk about all these administrative changes, we are even more excited about Scrubly going forward. We've got our new co-host Aiden, we've got our new focus on Heroes of the Storm, uh, and we're going to have a lot of great content coming up for you over the next couple of days uh, as BlizzCon rolls out. New announcements, HGC Finals, there's going to be a ton to cover, so you can follow us here on YouTube or wherever you're listening on SoundCloud. Uh, you can check you can check in with us on uh, Facebook and Instagram. You can talk to us uh, at Scrub League Cast on Twitter. Uh, you can speak with us privately at Scrub League Podcast at gmail.com. Um, and Aiden, you've got your own presence. Uh, where can they find you for your own uh, non-heroes content? Well, when I'm not laboriously editing this podcast, you can find me on Twitch at Handsome Peasant. I try to stream semi-regularly when I'm not being put to the whip by our slave drivers here. Alright, we'll let you out around episode 85 with good behavior. Uh, thanks again to Aiden for all of his uh, his work in the mines. Thanks to Phantom and Kay, who wrote the cool song that you hear throughout the show. And we hope to see you guys in the Nexus. Oh, That's not our on, outro. Kevin. We're not doing this, Kevin. Let's, let's no, it's, it's traditional. It's the best outro. It's not the best at all. <laughs>